Welcome to Corporate Warrior, the podcast that brings you the best advice on how to improve your health, optimize performance, and maximize productivity with your host, Lawrence Neal. What's up, guys? This is Lawrence Neal. Welcome to another episode of Corporate Warrior. On this podcast, I interview the experts on how to optimize productivity in fitness, business, and lifestyle to learn about the workout protocols, the principles, morning routines, daily habits, et cetera, et cetera, that you can use in your own life for better results. Guests include people like Getting Things Done author David Allen, Primal Diet giant Mark Sisson, high-intensity training author and pioneer Dr. Doug McGuff, more exercise and high-intensity training experts, scientists, successful entrepreneurs, startup founders, New York Times best-selling authors, elite adventure racers, and many more. Today's guest is Jay Vincent. Jay is a high-intensity training instructor operating his own studio out of Albany, New York. He's also a professional fitness model and sponsored muscle tech athlete. He's modeled for popular athletic clothing lines such as Under Armour and has also appeared in acting roles for Amazon.com. His muscle tech ads have been featured in many popular fitness magazines including Flex, Muscular Development, Muscle and Fitness, Fitness RX, if I'm saying that right, Iron Man, and more. This interview is epic, and I am not exaggerating when I say I think this is one of the most important things I've ever done. I think this content is possibly the best content I've ever put out. The reason I say that is because Jay Vincent is the only young, genetically gifted athlete who I've ever spoken with who practices high intensity training. Every single person I know or have seen or watched that looks like Jay is doing some kind of high frequency, overcomplicated gym routine that I think in most cases is highly inefficient. We explore why Jay is the outlier and what made him completely change his training to 20 minutes once or twice per week. In this interview, Jay explains how gym goers have it all wrong. He goes into specific details on his views on the exercise industry and the most effective workout protocols. And he gives, in very specific detail, his workout regimen, diet, supplement protocols, sleep habits, etc. You know what I'm like, I like to get into the details. There is some very important lessons here, especially regarding the general lack of appreciation in the fitness industry for the importance of genetics. Uh, you know, thousands of men suffer from, and women I should say, uh, suffer from body dysmorphia. And I personally have issues with this myself to a degree. Jay does a great job showing people how to effectively manage their expectations when it comes to training outcomes in this interview. For all the show notes and links, they'll be on the usual place on corpwarrior.com, that's C-O-R-P, warrior.com we also find jay's current workout routine that we mentioned in the interview so go to that page and if you don't see it on the site just search jay vincent it'll pop straight up and please share like crazy so very proud of this one um jay was an incredibly interesting guy it's a, a long interview two hours but i assure you if there's, a, there's, there's gems every five minutes this is not one way you have to wait to warm up it's just cracking all the way through in my opinion So without further ado, please enjoy this interview with the incredible Jay Vincent. So Jay, um, I'd really like to start off if we can, just by getting to know you a little bit better. So probably, I don't know, maybe some of the listeners know of you already, um, but I'd really like you to kind of go back to the start and take us on a journey. So looking at your bio, um, you obviously have a uh, American football career at college, uh, right. and you, it sounds like you got into training just before that. So, could you kind of take us back to that point in your life and what you were doing in terms of training, and and how, and then take us on kind of a journey, like a progression through, you know, what happened with American football and and how you got to where you are today, if you can do that for us. Sure. Yeah. The um, you know, my whole approach to training began as as a way to become faster, stronger, and put on muscle mass for football. I started playing football when I was eight years old, and um, as I got into high school, you know, uh, discovered weight training. Um, just started playing around with it a little bit at 16 years old. But as I graduated high school, I was going into um, college to play football, in which um, adding muscle mass was very important, so I didn't get beat up too bad. <laughs> so, um, um, 
began training seriously around 18 years old. I really began at 16 years old. And um, throughout college, I just, uh, you know, the football, the wear and tear of that kind of sport to me just over time just wasn't worth it. So, you know, all the preparation just to get injured kind of thing, it, it seemed kind of like a waste of time to me. Um, you know, the first, the second year, actually, I ended up breaking my clavicle and, um, you know, the athletic trainer looked at me like, oh, rub it off and go out there and play. And I said, this is stupid. This is not worth it. So I stopped playing football just for injury related reasons. And uh, I just still love to train. And, uh, you know, I saw great results at the end of high school when I was about 18 years old. I really I probably put on about 15 pounds um, within about four months. Wow. Um, I think I just hit that genetic growth spurt and I put on a lot of muscle. So I really did it for the results, for the feeling and um, also to get stronger for football towards the end of high school. But I, I like to train. So I continued to train outside of college and eventually I graduated college and um decided you know i had a lot of feedback from people around me like you're jacked man you're huge you're this you're that and uh you know why don't you try doing some fitness modeling so i said okay um i applied to an agency in new york city a popular one that i that was recommended to me and he said um you know yeah you look great you got a great look great muscles he's like but you're gonna have to put on 15 pounds <laughs> i said what <laughs> so you know, I thought I was muscular. I thought I was muscular, but what did you not, weigh? What did you weigh at that point? I was probably about 185 pounds. At how, that point. how tall are you? Five eleven. That's okay. So, so that's pretty. That's pretty big ish. That's what I thought. Yeah, yeah. And you know, he, you know, I don't know. So he told me I had to put on 15 pounds. So here I go. I started following what the bodybuilders were doing, eating every two and a half, three hours, you know, chicken and rice, meat and potatoes type Just of thing. Just to pause for a moment. So at this point, were you doing conventional training? Yes. Right? Yes. So like I was mul doing... multiple sets, many times a week, that type of thing. Exactly. I was taught to train that way throughout college, throughout high school, and I continued to train that way. Um, you know, I would I would do kind of a three way split, but I would do them each twice a week. So I would do um, – I kind of like doing things on a, a back day, chest day, leg day type of thing. Never did I see any necessity to do an arm day or a shoulder day. Even back then I knew that kind of sounded ridiculous. <laughs> so I did you know, chest Monday, Thursday, chest day, uh, Tuesday, Friday, back day, and Wednesday, Saturday, leg day. Mm -hmm. So at the time I was working as an insurance underwriter and I thought I had a problem because – I was so tired and run down every day. I couldn't stay awake. And as I was working as an insurance underwriter, I really didn't do much work. So I kind of scrolled through YouTube and uh, came across Doug McGuff's video. And I watched this video and light bulb went on. And I was like, oh, my God, I've been doing this wrong the entire time. This makes so much sense to me. I saw Doug McGuff's video. That led me to Drew Bay's video. I watched both of those videos and right there I started to gradually change into the high intensity style training. I didn't even know it was called high intensity style training at that point. I thought that was just the proper way to train. Hmm. So instead of, you know, two days a week, basically I started to cut down on volume. At first I did not buy the fact that you could only do one set to failure. It didn't make much sense to me. So I was still doing multiple sets, okay. eight to 12 repetitions. But then as I started to research more into it and learn what real muscular failure felt like, Within about six months to a year, I was doing everything. One set to failure, five or six exercises per workout. I started off on the on the full body routine, you know, um, more like Doug McGuff's big five type of thing, but maybe with a, a leg extension, leg curl in there. And I've gotten to the point as time progressed, I could do less and less and less because as I became stronger and as, you know, many of the other, other people on this podcast have expressed, the stronger you get and the ability to contract your muscles and create a deeper inroad will improve over time, but your ability to recover does not. Mm -hmm. So currently I am, I work out about, I try to train once every six days or so, because I notice if I introduce the stimulus before then, I have no strength and I feel like crap. I kind of base it off of when I wake up the next morning. If I feel like I got run over by a truck, 
I'm probably veering towards the overtraining state. And uh, that's kind of where I base it off of. And uh, since then, I've been doing this type of training for about three years, two and a half, really. And uh, I've noticed the best results with the most minimal um, time input that, that I thought was even imaginable for this sort of thing. And the reason – and I still find it you know, difficult to convince people okay. that I have a, obtained my physique training. You know, my, my workouts last – I wouldn't even say 20 minutes, probably around 15 minutes. And um, people find it very hard to believe that I achieved this physique. And it goes two ways. Oh, well, you've already done the work, so that's all you need to maintain. Or um, so, yeah, you've done the work, that's all you need to maintain. Or you have the genetics and this and that. They'll come up with that, every type of excuse they possibly could in order to to justify why I could possibly look the way I do. And really recently, I've been really trying to drive home the idea of genetics and the individual response to exercise varies on a very, you know, a bell curve. And I'm on you know, one of the other end of the, the fast responders. So that's kind of my, my training history in time intensity training. And right now I just practice um, more of a two way split. So I'm doing the um, in upper body day and uh separated by a couple of days and then a lower body day because frankly after my three or four lower body exercises i i cannot i have to go to bed after and that's kind of the point i'm at so i cannot it has to be at the end of the day it cannot be before work and it cannot be followed by anything important because the metabolic uh right. destruction so to speak that i i put my body through during just a fast probably eight minute leg workout it, it needs to have a very very adequate recovery that's really interesting. Hang on. So just so I understand, just to clarify, you said you trained every six days, but um, that that doesn't necessarily make sense to me in the context you just gave. So you said a few days between workouts. So I'm just. This, yeah, between each split. So okay. I will not touch the upper body split for around six days or the lower body split. Right. OK. So how many days do you have between workouts normally? So, um, say so between the upper body and the lower body. Oh, between split. the upper body. I'll yeah. give it minimum two days just for the central nervous system to recover, really. I mean, the muscle okay. hasn't been touched, but just for for that, you know, the, the, um, the pretty much cent- central nervous system recovery. Because, you know, the way I look at it, there are two types of, of recoveries. There's the actual physical recovery of the, the micro tears and the sarcomeres of your muscle. There's that recovery in them, but you're, the amount of stress your nervous system undergoes takes longer than just that, you know, the, the um, repair of the actual muscle tissue. So I do allow two days for um, two or three. It really depends on how I feel. I don't like having a structure, regimented calendar type. I'm going to train Tuesday, going to train Friday. I go by off of, you know, how I feel. If I miss a few more days than usual, I don't care because I know just off of experience the muscle tissue is not going to degenerate, you know, within a couple of days. And I feel like while I'm waiting and while I'm being lazy, I guess, muscle tissue is growing and repairing. That's the way I look at it. Have you ever experimented with stretching out your recovery periods even further? Like, because you say you train your the same split every six days. As, mm-hmm. as you said there, though, you will sometimes prolong that if you don't fill up to it. Um, mm-hmm. Do you think you could even get better gains if you gave yourself more recovery or are you at your genetic potential you might say at this point at this point i wouldn't even say i'm at my genetic potential i just think at you know where i am now the gains are going to start to come much much more slowly Mm -hmm. so do i think you know if i if i did 10 days instead of six um i don't think it would really matter because you know i don't think your your body doesn't work on that type of schedule your body's ready when it's ready either it's whether it's six whether it's 10 when it's ready it's ready you can introduce the stimulus on day seven day eight day 10 um i don't think it's going to progress it that much quicker but i think um you know going the sixth day opposed to the 10 but i also don't think going the 10th day is going to make it happen that much slower if you know what i'm saying yeah. so i don't like to play around with the minutia that much i think it needs to be I think the whole exercise stimulus, it needs to be kind of looked at in a more general, general way. You know, introduce the stimulus, recover, 
when you're ready, introduce it again. Okay. You know, a lot of people want, you know, people kind of measure how, many, how what their gains were in the course of a couple of months or the course of a couple of years. So if they could get 50 workouts in the course of a year, maybe if they got 60, maybe they would get better gains, but maybe not, you know, it's, it's, um, it's largely based on the individual, but I don't like to spend time, you know, worrying about that sort of thing. Your body's going to grow how it's going to grow. You know, why break it down to such minutia? Yeah, I agree. You, you just, when you were going through your story there, you raised so many questions for me and um, which I'm probably going to forget some of them now, but <laughs> one that really came up for me was, I bet you there's a lot of guys like you, you know, kind of mesomorphic, um, mm -hmm. I hope you won't be insulted if I call you a bit of a jock, but you 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 look like you're a little bit of a yeah. jock, right? Not insulted at all. <laughs> you don't worry. you even said on your Facebook about how something like meatheads can enjoy Star Wars or something like that, which I thought was quite yeah. funny. Um, mm -hmm. But I can imagine a lot of guys like you who look like you looking at that video with, with Doug McGuff, which is an incredible presentation. That was a presentation that inspired this whole podcast. Funnily enough, mm. um, oh. yeah. yeah. And they watch it. And I've seen the comments on YouTube like, oh, that can't be. What a load of nonsense, blah, blah, blah. You're obviously an intelligent guy and you can see past a lot of that. But mm -hmm. it just, I've never, it, it just astounds me that someone like you is open minded about this stuff and has actually gone and done it. Why is that? Why are you the, the one person? Or am I wrong and there's actually tons of guys just like you who have your, you know, genetics or, um, build or whatever, uh, and are as, as open-minded. And it's, it's tough. The way I look at it, and I've been trying to figure this out myself, why some people cannot open up their mind and try to grasp it. And I think some people, you know, I am a uh, very inquisitive individual. I like to, I almost have to research everything that I'm told because I will not believe it on faith. I will, I need to see something that proves it. I love that. So yeah. in, in that case, I feel like a lot of people do not want to do that kind of work and they like to take things on faith. And I think it's just, it's the way our brain works. Our brain, I don't think our brain wants to expend more energy than it needs to, to figure things out. So if people could just be told, do this or see someone who looks a certain way and follow what they do. It's much easier for someone to do that. But I don't like to take anything on faith. And I think there's a small amount of the population. This, I don't know, this might be arrogant, might sound arrogant, but it's a small amount of the population has the ability to ignore what they've previously been conditioned to think and raise some questions. And those are normally the type of people, in my opinion, that have to ha that have kind of uh, influential revelations that such as exercise type revelations. Mm -hmm. And I just think there are just a small amount of people who have the cognitive ability to do that. And uh, I, I just so happened to be one of them who liked to raise a lot of questions and, you know, gave it a shot. And now I don't, I don't like to call myself, you know, part of a hit cult. I don't think I'm in the high intensity training cult. I just like evidence based things. And this is an evidence-based workout protocol, you know, and um, that's the reason I follow it. Because to me, you know, once you understand the basic physiology of it, I, it just, any other way just doesn't make sense to me. So I don't yeah. see why, you know, what in, in motor fiber recruitment, once you understand how motor fiber, motor units are recruited and fatigued, you know, the, you know, doing an additional set, I would just feel stupid doing it kind of thing. You know what I mean? But the whole, you know, getting people to train that way to where they can recruit and fatigue as many motor units as possible. I don't believe many people can do it on their own, which I feel like yeah. a, a large percentage of the population will benefit from multiple sets because as you've probably been in the gym and noticed, most people quit the second that the weight starts to get uncomfortable. They so within the course of one set, most of the population will not fatigue their muscles enough to respond just with that one set. So if I were to write someone a workout plan and they haven't trained with me or I haven't showed them how to achieve muscular failure, I would probably tell them to do multiple sets in order to fatigue their muscles enough to stimulate a sort of response. So for most people, the one set to failure, unless you've been properly instructed, um, 
you know, may not work as well as multiple sets because they're, they're not, they don't know what muscular failure feels like and they do not know how to achieve it on their own. So um, I think that answered your question. Oh, that kind of went off on a little bit of a tangent. <laughs> now it's a great answer. Okay. So what did you, I'm assuming you majored in something to do with insurance. Am I right? At college? I just majored in business economics okay. in, uh, in college. Yeah. How did you find that? You know, when I went to college, you know, I, I, I think college is, uh, for the lack of better words, kind of a scam. You know, I think they cut, they get people to go to college when, you know, at 18 years old, you really don't know what the heck it is you want to do. And, uh, I went to college for business economics because, well, I have to go to college and get a job and make money. Cool. So did that, went to college, got a job, didn't really know what I liked. I was kind of into cars at the time. You know, I liked repairing, modifying, fixing cars. That was kind of like my hobby, my first hobby. And then, you know, after college, um, when I got the job, I was like, well, this sucks. <laughs> so <laughs> what I did was, um, as my uh, interest for exercise started to grow and, you know, people started to ask me questions about it. I noticed I really enjoyed answering them and I really enjoyed training people. So what I did was I quit my job and I pursued a personal training career. And that's, you know, where I am now. Did you, um, start the personal training career in tandem or did you go just, you know, jump out of the plane, out of the parachute, you know, cut out, cut out the job and just try and make it happen. Did you have some like, savings exactly what or? I did. Okay. Yeah. No, there was no slow progression. You know, I was, you know, I was like, this is, you know, I'm all about, I, I firmly believe in living a life that's worth living and that you enjoy. And I feel like a lot of people, maybe because that's how they were raised or their parents grew up, um, kind of just, they base, their happiness on their income and their life is about working and then everything else kind of falls by the wayside. I kind of wanted to flip that around and I told, asked myself, what would I be enjoy doing right now if I was not at this job? And I was like researching and exercise, researching exercise and training people. Cause that's what I did while I was at work the whole time. Anyway, just research exercise. <laughs> so I'm like, well, I might as well try to turn this into some sort of income. So I just hopped up, took off and I'm like, I'll make it work. I'll make it work. You know, if you want it bad enough, it'll work. So, yeah, I just did that, and I just started training people at their gyms, which most gyms don't really like. <laughs> and uh, then I ended up finding a um, a uh, high-intensity training studio where I live in Albany, New York. And, um, you know, it was it was going – you know, I think uh, the, the owner had about 15, 20 clients at the time, but – I wanted to open my own, so I looked him up and I just wanted to try MedX equipment because I had never seen it before. Okay. And it turned out the owner was diagnosed with cancer, and he was looking for someone else to run his facility and sell it to. And um, so I was in the right place at the right time, and I just took over what is now called Studio 2020. It's a MedX-based um, high-intensity training studio. And uh, right now I'm training about 60 clients or 60 sessions a week and kind of made it boom, made it grow from where it was before. Because, you know, as, as our heuristics make us think, you know, when you see someone who's in good shape, you're going to tend to believe them a little more. So taking on a fitness model bodybuilder to instruct this type of workout is a very good marketing technique, <laughs> even though, you know, I do truly believe in it. But, you know, even so, you know, even if, if the technique was complete garbage, um, you know, people would do it, <laughs> you know, so, but what's great is that I can encourage people yeah. and, um, you know, motivate them. You know, you can, if your genetics allow, achieve a very good physique with this little exercise if done properly. And, you know, I can prove it. Yeah, thing. I have no problem with you using your physique as, a, as an asset in that regard. It's mm -hmm. when you get people who have physiques like yours who um, then have awful teachings that I have a problem with. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, like so, most of them. Yeah, like the most of them. True, true. Um, I wanted to just ask you a quick question about your uh, experience in modeling. Um, because you you mentioned in a bio that you you uh you you got into a prestigious agency in New York. Mm -hmm. I wanted to understand like how. I mean, you actually gave a hint just now. You said about the guy I was like, yeah, yeah, dude, you need to add fifteen pounds more muscle. Like, how mm -hmm. hard is it? How competitive is it? And you know, to, to get into that, and, and what's it it's, like? It's yeah. It's it's really competitive, you know. I, especially you cannot. Yeah, you cannot do it as a full time job, and um, 
you know, I, I sort of knew that going in, but I just wanted to test the waters and see what it was like. But, um, no, you cannot do it. It is not a career. It is, it is, if you have the ability to get into an agency and you're marketable, it is a good hobby. You know, I'll probably do two or three shoots a year. You know, the last one I did was for Under Armour, um, about two months ago. And, you know, it's, it's extremely competitive. You can have the best physique, the most beautiful hair, skin, whatever, but that may not be what certain companies want to market their product with. So my particular agency, you know, has a slew of models, plenty of them. And, um, it's, it, you know, you kind of work your way up. If you book a couple jobs, people who are booking you know this and say, well, you have experience or you're marketable and then you'll continue to book a little more. So the first one that really got the snowball rolling was, uh, muscle tech. If you're familiar with the yeah. supplements, um, they, they booked me for a shoot, um, which is now in an ad and I believe all of the muscle magazines now and that that was shot about a year ago. Um, so I, I may look different now, but, um, that kind of, once you book with a, you know, a magazine type shoot, um, you're going to be requested a little more. So shortly after that, I was requested for amazon.com to do a commercial, um, um, there was a German magazine, Men's Fitness or Men's Health Muscle, that I did. How come Amazon.com? What's the relevancy there? It, what they wanted was – it was funny. It was called Kindle Love Stories. Um, so if anyone looks this up, I'm going to be mad because it was embarrassing. <laughs> but it's called Kindle Love Stories, and they wanted hunks for <laughs> to promote their love stories because the, uh, apparently, you know – Women love, you know. I think, the, I, got an, I think I got an email about that actually. <laughs> oh yeah, you did, huh? Yeah, I didn't see you there. I was. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that's you know that's what it was. It was just a commercial, you know, reading an excerpt from a romance novel kind of thing, and it was like a, a little web series thing I did. So yeah, that was a little different. But they just wanted hunks, not you know, yoked up bodybuilders, so to speak. But I mean, the my physique isn't yoked up bodybuilder you know massive amount of hormone looking physique so i can do multiple things like in an under armor more athletic type type shoe in modeling and right now you know i'm not busting my hump to get work for modeling really i just when it comes i take it you know mm -hmm. and uh you know that's kind of how that industry works you just kind of hang out you have to find something else to do on the side and if the opportunity pre presents itself it pays very well so just you know there you go. Then you just happen to it when the opportunity presents itself. So when you get one of these um, these gigs come up, do you have to prepare specifically for that? Or I mean, I know you stay in shape all year round, but like, do you have to go extreme? Like, okay, I'm going to do a shoot for Under Armour. They want me to be like four percent body fat or whatever. Like, how do you prepare for that? And That's does funny. that happen? I've, that I've gotten thing? that question a couple times, and um, yeah. it's a competitive industry. If you're not in shape. You're not getting booked again. So if you show up out of shape and um, they, I don't know, they may send you home. I don't know. But if you show up out of shape, that's it. That's the end of your modeling career. So basically what you have to do is you have to be in shape all the time. So who are going to be successful in mod modeling? Those who are pre genetically predisposed to being lean pretty much no matter what they do. Because what type of person would really want to just be measuring and weighing food 12 months out of the year in hopes of getting a modeling gig? Nobody. That's that's a waste of time. So I do nothing different. I just stay around the, I don't know, eight to 10 percent body fat. I don't know what I am. And, um, you know, when a model gig comes, I'm always ready. I'm always in shape. But I mean, you know, I, if I get a long enough of a notice when usually if you get a week's notice, that's great because they are, you know, you have a shoot in three days type of thing. You know, you All don't right. get you don't get a, a long enough notice to even reduce your body fat enough significantly to make a difference. Uh, the most notice I've ever gotten was for the muscle tech shoot, which I had a two week notice, which I did cut carbohydrates. Um, you know, well, I mean, not all carbohydrates. I just ate strictly green vegetables for carbohydrates to reduce body fat, okay. but that's pretty much all I did. And, um, so no, no, you do not get a significant amount of time to prepare for them. You have to be ready. Um, because it is a competitive industry and there will be someone that is ready if you don't step up to the plate. So it's, um, it's an interesting industry to, to say the least. Okay. Um, good stuff. I wanted to understand, you said, um, you said how you, 
I, well, I'm not going to say you said you, you made gains, but you said you got great results having switched from conventional training. So, you know, multiple sets, more workouts per week to moving to a high intensity training type format. Did you say, did you gain more size or did you? Oh, absolutely. Really? Yes. Um, so that's where I got my, uh, 10 pounds of mass from. Okay. And that's why I'm such a firm believer in it. Um, because I was busting my hump in the gym and I was bringing package, packages of tuna around with me and doing all these ridiculous bodybuilding type uh, techniques that they do to put muscle mass on, you know, <laughs> eating 10 eggs in the morning type of thing. <laughs> and the gain in the gains were not coming. And um, I knew there was a problem here. I said, well, maybe I hit my genetic potential, but, you know, I didn't really know that much about genetics back then. So I said, well, I might as well try a different approach. And I just started backing off a little bit and, uh, hit, you know, fatiguing the muscle groups deeper with harder exercise rather than more exercise. And it takes a while to really grasp how this feels and how this is done. So it took me a couple of months to really understand what, you know, going to muscle failure on a chest press feels like, you know, because your body is telling you, put this weight down. It's screaming at you to stop what you're doing. And you have to mentally continue to put yourself through that. And that's why a lot of people are not able to reach this on their own. So it did take me a while to learn how to do this. But as I learned how to do this, I would benefit from less and less exercise. So once I learned how to really contract my muscle, and that's a lot of what I try to teach clients, and it's very tough to articulate to clients, is how to really contract the working muscle during an exercise. Once, once a trainee can learn how to do that, their gains will come very quickly because they can inroad that particular muscle group more deeply. So you know, once I learned to do that, then the gains started to come a little quicker. And even at this point, you know, when it comes to diet, I don't have to sit there and measure six ounces of chicken every time I eat because the exercise stimulus is so intense that I believe no matter what I put in my body, it's going to it's going to go to muscle tissue repair rather than store body fat. So th that's kind of where it all came from. Okay. The whole 10 pounds of, uh, you know, I don't know if it was 10 pounds, but I, I put on significantly more muscle mass by training the muscle groups harder and less frequently, which is what made me a really firm believer in this type of protocol. That's very interesting. Um, when you, actually we'll get into the specifics of your workout in a sec, um, but do you know anyone who um, perhaps uh, friends of yours or colleagues who like you have a you know I don't like saying genetic advantage because I know you've worked hard for what you have, um, mm -hmm. but you, you have a kind of mesomorph build. I think I don't think you'd disagree with me on that. Right, so, no, it's true. Do you have like do you have colleagues or friends of yours who like like you? share your point of view or is it literally like you're the guy on the edge over here doing high intensity training and everyone else like nah no jay it's all about high volume and you know yeah. this other stuff uh, yeah no it's only me it's just me and you know i i can explain this in full detail in as much detail as many examples as i can possibly find <laughs> to try to convince you know my Friends, I wouldn't say my colleagues because most of my colleagues at this point are high intensity training advocates, so they agree with me. But you know, my, I have plenty of friends who they're always texting, emailing me, you know, send me a diet, send me a workout plan. And you know, it's the same stuff I've been telling them for the past however many years, but since they have not yet achieved my physique, they think I'm still withholding some massive secret from them. You're like, okay, put onions on everything and you will get jacked, I swear. <laughs> you know, they think I'm withholding something from them. You know, I've given them the no refined carbohydrate diet plenty of times. I've taken them through workouts, you know, some of my friends. And um, still within a, you know, next time they go work out by themselves or back to the multiple set routine. Because, you know, I have two theories. One, maybe they feel it is not enough because within that one workout, they didn't turn into Arnold Schwarzenegger, which maybe they thought they would have. Or two, um, it's much too difficult because um, yeah. I, I do not train lightly. And those who seek my advice and want to train with me, I'm going to put them through the same style training that I put myself through. And it is usually much, much more difficult than what they are used to. So, you know, I have I have plenty of friends. You know, um, a cousin that is really into bodybuilding and, um, you know, I can 
give him my advice, you know, as much as I possibly can, but he's going to go back to what he was doing before because it's very hard to grasp that this little exercise is adequate. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, question from Fred, a mutual friend, Fred Hahn. Um, he, uh, let me just read his question so I can get it out correctly. Um, do you feel that, and you may have already answered this in part, but do you feel that a high intensity, slow rep speed approach to strength training is superior to high volume, fast rep tempo for building muscle and strength? Of course. <laughs> yeah, of course. I've been trying to tell people this for two years, but yeah, no, it, it absolutely is. And, and the reason is, like I said, the minutia, the, the, how many reps, rep tempo, uh, what type of exercises, I don't think that matters that much because the goal at the end of the day is to fatigue muscle deeply enough to stimulate the body to adapt by producing gains in strength and size. And that is done by just simply fatiguing muscles. So you can do it in one set to muscular failure um, if properly instructed and if you can properly do it yourself. Um, for those people who, who have not been properly instructed, um, after a little bit of practice, I'm sure they'll be able to do it. But for most people, maybe multiple sets may benefit them a little more because they are not able to reach that level of inroad within one set. Um, rep tempo and cadence, I believe moving slowly is extremely important because, first of all, if um, you are moving slowly – you are eliminating momentum, and all momentum does is help your muscle complete the movement. So the point of an exercise is to fatigue a particular muscle group. So using momentum would be relatively pointless in that case. So I really believe in moving the weight for about a 5 to 10 second positive, 5 to 10 second negative. You know, for my particular clients, I don't sit there and count to 10 seconds because people have different motor skills and they have – you know, different uh, levels of coordination. So as long as if you're watching a particular client or watching somebody exercise, you can tell if there is momentum involved or not. And this is where turnarounds at the top of the range of motion and the bottom of the range of motion are very important. That is where momentum likes to aid in changing the direction of the weight. So I believe that is hugely important for avoiding injury and for placing maximum tension on the muscle. And I noticed just um, with a couple of my clients – Sometimes they'll get a little, um, they'll get a little excited. They'll start moving weight a little quicker, and then I will meticulously slow them down. Right. And I'll say, okay, now on the leg press, for instance, I'll say, no, ease it back very slowly and pause. Now ease into it forward. And as soon as I do that to them, and don't let them lock out or anything like that. Their muscles will fatigue so rapidly that they'll get one more repetition, which if I let them do what they were doing in the in the first place, they probably would have got five or six. Mm -hmm. So for that fact alone, for that rep cadence and that method to fatigue their muscles that deeply to where they can only do one more repetition, to me it just makes perfect sense that that is superior at fatiguing muscle, which is necessary to promote a stimulation and adaptive response. Mm -hmm. So yes, I think that a slow cadence high intensity training protocol is far superior than multiple set. First of all, you should never move weight fast. I think that's absolutely ridiculous because, um, I mean, people get hurt throwing baseballs because <laughs> very fast movement yeah. produces injury. And especially if you repeat it over over a, a long period of time, it's going to produce a, re, a repetitive motion injury. But I don't think anybody should weight move, move weight quickly. And again, if the weight is heavy enough to create a deep amount of fatigue, you cannot move heavy weight quickly anyway. So if you can move this weight quickly, I don't think it's um, the weight is adequate. You know, anyway. So, um, but yes, uh, multiple sets for for most people, high intensity training protocol or uh, multiple sets will probably serve to be a little more beneficial because unless they're instructed in the high intensity protocol, but if properly instructed, or if you can do it properly on your own, the high intensity training protocol with low volume and low frequency is, I believe far superior. And I am, you know, I witnessed it because I I've done both and I've noticed a better improvement doing the high intensity training protocol. And I'm still continuing to get stronger and grow you know, even though it's much more slowly than it used to be, mm -hmm. but I'm not tired. I do not get injured. 
and I barely spend any time in the gym. Who wouldn't want that <laughs> in order to produce maximum results? I mean, I do not like going to the gym. It's awful. I get I get <laughs> nervous on the way there because my body knows it's about to get the crap beat out of it. I notice that I start getting nervous. My heart starts beating when I'm when I'm getting ready to work out because it knows it's nervous. It's a negative, stressful event for the body. So. You know, if anybody says they like going to the gym, I tell them that they're doing it wrong. I mean, it, I might, <laughs> you know, uh, you know, it's a little arrogant and mean, I guess. But uh, you know, maybe people need that in order to switch things up and work out a little harder. And then I go into you know fatiguing muscle. But yeah, no, no. But, I mean, I think most people would want to spend as little time in the gym as possible. And you know, as as Doug McGuff, I watched um, an inter- interview with him last week. And he said, you know, if you were to take a stopwatch and time the amount of tension that the muscle was being placed on throughout their hour workout, it, you know, with all the BS aside, walking around, getting a drink of water, it would be far less than his average client in his studio. And I believe that, too, because most of the people are checking their email, it's talking to their buddies, getting a drink of water. That's why it lasts an hour. You know, you try to you try to do an hour of exercise on my MedEx equipment here, you'll be throwing up, you know, so that's you- why I'm so whenever I talk about conventional training, like multiple set training, I never I try to avoid the use of the word volume, because yeah. actually, like Doug said, and I'm, I'm correct I'm wrong, but that was on one of my podcasts with him. You know, if we're not careful, we are the high volume trainers. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah, exactly. of the time under loads. Um. It just made me laugh because I think Fred knew you were going to say all that. He just asked that question. Yeah, he I've, I've answered that question to Fred a few times. <laughs> he just wants you to validate it. I understand yeah, why, though. I'll validate it over and over again. I don't care. <laughs> um, another question from a, uh, a fan of mine whose name I'm going to try not to butcher. It's quite funny. I asked him in advance, how do I say your name? Because it's 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 a strange, it's a, a difficult one. But it's uh, Oivind Northwaite. I think I've said that correctly. Um, he wanted to ask you, how um, rampant are performance enhancement drugs in the fitness modeling industry? You know, it's tough to say because there are some young men who look amazing and it's entirely due to genetics, but you know, they're not that big. You know, you can almost tell, I mean, the drug issue is very, touchy for a lot of people. And I think you can tell when someone is on drugs because they just look too massive. But then again, there are plenty of people who have been in my gyms and who are, who have been in my gym and gyms that I've gone to who are on drugs and still look like crap. So the fact that these hormones will inevitably produce this beautiful physique is wrong because I've seen plenty of people take massive amounts of these hormones. They haven't told me directly, but I've heard about what they have taken and they still look awful. And I don't know if I would blame that on the diet, but I would blame that, you know, mostly on genetics. So in the fitness modeling industry, the fitness modeling industry, I don't think they're as prevalent as the bodybuilding industry, but I'm sure they're in there, you know, in order, you know, if you've got a, you know, a 230 pound male with 6% body fat, you know, most likely he's taking something. But if you've got 175 pound year old, aesthetic, nice looking young man, I no, probably not, you know, that sort of thing. So you can almost tell, you know, 19 inch arms and, you know, (laughs) 31 inch waist, there's something going on there. But, um, I don't know factually how prevalent it is, but of course it's in there. And, you know, the problem with the fitness industry is they are using people like this um, to convince people that you can achieve this type of physique with, you know, X exercise protocol or P90X or whatever. Um, When the people they are using to promote these exercise routines don't necessarily do them. And uh, I may take some heat for saying this, but I've been casted to do, I can't remember what it was called. I think it was called some kind of aeroglide or some stupid ab machine. 
I was casted to do it. I had never heard of what the thing was. So, you know, they put the people in these videos and they say, yeah, these people got like this from using this stupid piece of exercise equipment when most of the models have never even heard of the thing. They just go in there, they show them how to do it, they do it, and that's that. So they are using genetically superior people, of course, in order to market and advertise some of some of the products. But I mean, of course they are. I mean, I'm not going to get mad at them for saying that. You know, they need to make profit on some of the stuff. But some of the bodybuilding type products, so to speak, um, are very misleading because, yes, the bodybuilders, as we all know, are taking a large amount of hormones. And, you know, I'm sure people might give me crap for this, but come on, we all know it. We yeah. see it. You cannot be 260 pounds and under 10 percent body fat without them. That's not a, a natural look for the human body. Are you completely full natural? Absolutely, yes. And, you know, people find that hard to believe, but, you know, I'm not that big. <laughs> you know, no, that, I, that's I felt, the point I'm making. I've actually, I was quite nervous asking you that question because I feel horrible asking it because... I've been, you know, since I was 17 years old in high school, I've been accused of not being natural. Really? I'm like, I'm, yeah, I remember particularly when I was doing track, I was doing a 100 meter dash and I heard some kid yelling, steroids, steroids, steroids. I'm like, I'm 17 years old. Like, <laughs> where would I even get my hands on this stuff? But, you know, you see someone who looks so different. Yeah. And, you know, obviously they're going to jump, people are going to jump to a conclusion as to, or find, try to find a reasoning why they don't look like that. There must be something. There must be something. God forbid you just, you know, got, I wouldn't say good genetics. You've got different genetics. you got, you know, not necessarily being extremely lean probably isn't the best approach for survival. But, you know, in this society we, we can be, but, you know, I, I like to tell my clients, it's a bit of a exaggeration, but. You know, just because I look this way doesn't mean I'm any healthier than you, which I probably eat healthier than most people. But, you know, it doesn't mean I'm healthier than you. And if I were in the wild, if I couldn't store body fat, I would die. Mm -hmm. So I could be at a disadvantage. You know, this could be a genetic mutation or a genetic shortcoming rather than um, superior genetics, which we like to view them as because of their rarity and people want to look like this because people really do strive to separate themselves from the pack. And that's why looking more lean or more muscular is desirable, but I wouldn't even call them superior genetics. I would call them superior for fitness marketing. Yeah, definitely. But for a survival standpoint, standpoint, it could, it could have been, um, could have been a hindrance, you know, not being able to store body fat, but I guess I look, above average muscularity and, and leanness, but you know, I don't look like uh, the 230 pound vein popping bodybuilder. No, <laughs> so that's true, that's true. that whole, you know, the whole drug argument, you know, it's been going on for 10 years. Of course, people are going to accuse you of it, but you know, what about the 16 year old kid with a ripped six pack? I mean, it's just people, people get upset that they haven't looked that way or can't look that way or do not yet look that way. And they must find a reasoning, but that's okay. Okay, cool. Good answer. Um, we talked earlier, you talked earlier about the importance of intensity and how that can be difficult to be able to train to that level and need mm -hmm. perhaps some experience or, or even a personal trainer to help you do that. And I, I found certainly in my training that sometimes I could really do with a personal trainer to help get me there when I really don't feel like it. Yeah. Um, so another question from um, Oywind was, uh, how is training to near failure good enough or is there a marked difference between training near failure and your experience to actually properly training to failure in in the definition you give i think tr training to near failure first of all over a course of training to failure very consistently within a six weeks to a couple months or so i think a couple of not to failure workouts might be beneficial for your recovery ability so sometimes if I'm feeling a little rundown or feeling a little weak, I will train not to failure. I will still only do one set. I will stimulate the muscle just enough, um, but not inroad any deeper. Um, people training just nearly to failure, just I like to call it touching failure, may it will, I believe that it will produce a result. Um, but I also believe that a little more frequency um, would help you along a little quicker. You know, people train just touching failure once a week will get them their results much, much slower. 
if they were to do twice a week, I believe, or compared to training a, to a deep inroad once a week is definitely much more effective, if that makes sense. Definitely. So touching failure, if you're going to touch failure, as I like to say it, a little more frequency is probably, I wouldn't say necessary, but you could benefit from a little more frequency. Um, but it's, you know, that's, it is difficult to get to that point on your own. Even myself, I would love to have somebody train me and see how far they could push me because I haven't had that in years. But with the assistance of a trainer, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to get that person really deep into failure just by, by reading their body language. I'm going to make sure I get a deep enough inroad out of, you know, most people. I mean, my 82 year old client, probably not. Those are the type of people I like to touch failure on. So I believe it's based on the individual, someone who isn't in the greatest shape, a little bit fragile, maybe older, maybe uh, more of my senior clients. I'm not going to try to create that deep of an inroad in them because, um, you know, they're older and their nervous system probably isn't able to handle the recovery as if uh, a 25 year old would. But if I have a 25 year old client, I'm going to have them inroad very, very deep. So those, you know, just touching failure, I, I really think it does. De- it depends on your genetics, age, maybe a little bit of your athletic ability, which are, you know, dictated by genetics. But is it beneficial? Sure. Is it ideal? No. Um, if you can get a trainer to help you through there or just practice, really practice on once you reach that level of discomfort where you want to quit. What I like to tell clients or encourage them to do is is use that as an indication that that is where the exercise becomes beneficial. The more you can push through that, this may not be entirely true, but I like to tell them, especially on the leg press, the more you can push through that discomfort, that signal, everything telling you to stop, the better result you're going to get from that exercise. So I do believe a deep inroad is, is the most beneficial way to train. Um, you talked earlier about how if you do like a leg workout that you'll time it just before bed because you know you're not going right. to be able to do anything afterwards. Um, how do you personally um, keep performance levels up on the days following a hit session? And I guess what he means by performance, I'm going to assume, is you know how are you focused in your work? How do you um, I don't know if you play sport. Like how do you how do you optimize recovery following your training sessions? Is there anything you do there? Yeah, yeah, uh, definitely. It, it, I've noticed for optimizing my own recovery, training at night right before a meal in bed seems to work amazing. Because um, I've just noticed, you know, if I were to train in the morning, I would have nothing. Left. I would not be able to keep my eyes open the rest of the day. It's, you know, I feel the the urge to nap. Um, so I think training in a way to where you, you know, you have adequate recovery where, you know, there isn't something that's going to be tremendously mentally or physically demanding immediately after, or even the next day. You know, I notice if I have a 6am client, I'm not going to train legs at night because I'm going to wake up and feel like crap. So kind of planning your, your training, maybe most people might not be able to do that, but with workouts this infrequently, you may be able to do that. Yeah. So I like to, to plan my training around things like that. Mostly I try to do them. I try to train at night before, I guess, dinner, uh, my last meal of the day. Um, normally I train probably around 8 p.m. just due to my heavy workload okay. and eat a meal right off to bed. That seems to enhance my recovery the best. Because the sleep is going to help your nervous system recover. Sleep is extremely important when it comes to seeing um, um, gains and adaptations from exercise. And a lot of people do not place a, a heavy emphasis on sleep. Maybe it's the, the Western society, you know, you know, work your ass off. Don't worry about sleep. You'll sleep when you're dead type of thing. But, you know, it really needs to be taken seriously. And uh, I tell my clients, get at least eight hours, at least seven, seven or eight hours, depending on how old you are, because it's really going to help you. And personally, I've noticed a huge difference. Interesting. We'll get into sleep a little bit more in a second, actually, because I'm interested on how you how you optimize that. Um, Okay, cool. So let's get into your specific regimen and lifestyle and stuff like that. Um, You've already mentioned your current workout regimen. You actually posted your which I'm assuming is a workout you do currently uh, on your yeah. Facebook, which is that two-way split, which I'll post in the show notes. 
uh, cool. for people to see that. Um, but one thing I couldn't see looking at that regimen is how much rest do you have between exercises? Oh, I don't rest at all. I, yeah, I, I mean, a few seconds, just enough to change the weight and go from machine to machine. Okay. But I do not, I do not like to sit there really as, as most people like to do. I, and that's what makes the workout so quick is I really do not rest just enough to really adjust the machine or, or go, go from exercise to exercise really. And I, I like to incorporate supersets now and then, you know, as, as you may have noticed, I, I believe in that workout, I will start off with a chest fly or a pec deck and uh, really focus on squeezing and contracting the muscle and getting a ton of blood in there and immediately follow it by a chest press. I find that to that really, I feel a lot of stimulation in, in the pec region um, from that workout. And that's what I like to stick with, but I will not do that um, over and over and over. That'll be, you know, an every other workout type of thing, you know, just so I don't, um, overtrain. I really, really try to avoid overtraining, you know? So I like to do superset type things. Um, now and then on the, on the leg, on a leg routine, for instance, I, um, I find the leg extension to failure immediately followed by a leg press to failure is very effective. Um, but cannot be done every single time because it's, it's just really, really, really stressful. Um, but those sorts of things, just for, you know, intensity multipliers, I, I like to do some supersets, um, some rest pause and uh, drop sets too, uh, breakdown sets, um, breakdown spe- sets, especially for the chest press I like to do as well. So I'll start off with a weight that I could do about four or five reps of to failure, drop it, couple reps, drop it, couple reps, done. So this whole the whole exercise still lasts for about a minute and a half. So the breakdown sets are, are sort of a thing. I, I still consider that all one set because I have not taken a break. But yeah, I that's a that's a, a nice chess uh, intensity multiplier I like to use. Is it? Do you? Because um, I remember in I can't remember the exact mechanism or benefit, but I think uh, Doug McGuff advocates moving from machine to machine quickly. So mm-hmm. through the metabolic conditioning, is that the reason why you go so quickly from machine to machine? Is it? I mean, kind of, I, I, I just don't see the need to rest in between it. <laughs> I just think, okay. you know, I, and yes, your cardiovascular system is getting a hell of a workout when you're moving from machine to machine and the global metabolic conditioning that Doug, Doug McGuff um, describes definitely, definitely seems to be a benefit of it as well, because, um, you know, I look at working, you know, you're going from a chest, you know, press exercise to a horizontal pull exercise. I don't see the need to let the chest rest before you're going to do a horizontal pull. So I like to split it like that. I'll do a pushing movement to a pulling movement, pushing to pulling. So you're kind of crossing them like that. So um, I do believe moving from machine to machine, you're getting the effect of a whole body metabolic kind of metabolic destructive workout doing it that way rather than taking a couple of seconds to rest. But, you know, with my own clients, you know, I have some clients with, um, you know, AFib and COPD that they do have to rest in between exercises. Okay. And, you know, if, if somebody is rushing through, I wouldn't say rush through, but definitely take as little time possible, you're going to get a better cardiovascular workout, I guess, from that. And, um, you know, don't push it to the point where you're going to vomit every time, you know what I mean? Because that's, you know, kind of counterproductive. But, um, you know, anything you can do to make it a little more stressful and a little harder is usually um, beneficial and usually a step in the right direction. Um, So those sort of things, I think they're good. But I don't think moving from machine to machine as fast as you can is really necessary. Mm -hmm. You know, because some people and some, some of my clients in particular, they put so much into one set that if I were to move them immediately to another machine, they would probably pass out. So if, the, if you can put a lot of your nervous system into one exercise, and um, then maybe they could take a little rest from machine to machine. But you know, most people starting off with a high intensity training protocol aren't able to do that most likely. So they should they would benefit more from moving quickly, I believe. Okay, so. The counter argument to that, if you call it a counter argument, is that I know I know in a, for instance in the four hour body, um, Tim Ferriss in the OCAMS protocol section. I don't know if you've have you read the four hour body? Are you familiar? No, with I've 
I've heard of it, but I haven't read it. Oh, dude, you should definitely read that book. It's very interesting. Um, oh, yeah. You know, I'm sure you know a lot about Tim. He's quite famous there in the States. Yeah, well, so. yeah. Um, so it's like a hacker's guide to the body. And, you know, it's evidence-based and there's a lot of like controversial stuff in there but it's interesting nonetheless um so in the geek to freak part which is where he gained something like 20 to 30 pounds in a month um you know that he, he did start doing that experiment when he was quite uh he'd withered down from too much tango in south america and uh, not training mm. so he perhaps had some beginner gains there but that's just a whole another conversation point i was trying to get to is um the protocol he advocates is a one set to failure, high intensity training protocol with only two exercises per workout in a split routine um, and three minutes in between exercises. And I think the logic behind that is to reduce the fatigue from the previous exercise so that when you come to a next exercise, you're able to bring it more. Um, but actually I'm starting to think in my head, well, maybe if you're warmed up from the previous, actually that's going to help you do a better performance. So it's mm -hmm. kind of counterintuitive, but what are your thoughts around, around that specifically? Yeah. You know, I think, do you think again, it has any it's, benefit? Um, I think it could. And again, based largely on the individual, you know, someone such as myself or, you know, more people who have trained in the high intensity protocol for a long time, I believe that that may be beneficial to them because they are, they are having, they're working so hard throughout that first exercise that maybe they need a little bit of rest in order to put everything into the next exercise. So I think for a more advanced trainee that could serve some benefit. Okay. But for an in advanced trainee, um, I think that would be, you know, that would be useless. It would be kind of pointless to wait that long because it would reduce the overall amount of fatigue and stress that their body is having throughout one workout. So I would move, you know, a, a beginner client more quickly through in order to create a more systemic fatigue, maybe so to speak, okay. and kind of fatigue their whole body a little little more harsh i guess than if you know if you were to allow them to wait three minutes in between each exercise they're really not putting forth that much into each exercise so i think the exercise at the end of the workout would probably be a little less effective so he may be really demolishing his nervous system and, and his muscles throughout that one set of exercise to where that may be beneficial you know through if you're doing just a pushing and a pulling exercise yeah, that may be beneficial because you've you've fatigued everything so deeply that you need to recover a little bit in order to put your nervous system back into the next exercise. Yeah. But I think it, it, to me, it, it would make more sense for an advanced trainee to do something like that. I wouldn't recommend it to someone who who's new to this. Okay. Um, you mentioned about how your workouts vary. Uh, on occasion, you'll do supersets or breakdown sets. Mm -hmm. um, how do you? decide on what it is you're going to do when you go to gym do you have for instance right now like a six-week plan or are you like you kind of okay i know today's an upper body day and then you just go on how you feel in terms of your workout i mean how 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 what's the word i'm looking for how um anal are you about making sure you're like okay i must track every single variable so that i can make sure i'm getting i can you know if i'm improving i know that you know, I'm looking at it for a scientific lens, like no variables have changed. You, you know where I'm going with this. Yeah, I don't <laughs> spend, like I said, I don't spend a lot of time in the minutia. I don't, yeah. I, you know, I go in there, you know, I've, I've achieved the gains I'm looking to achieve, so to speak. And if I don't improve too much again, I'm okay with it because I'm okay with where I am right now. But basically when I go in for a workout, I look at which muscle groups I need to hit. I need to hit the pectorals, the front delts, the triceps, you know, if I'm doing an upper body, I need to hit the lats and uh, rear delts, rhomboids, traps. So basic movements. I need to do a pull down in order to hit the lats and the biceps. Okay. I'm going to do some sort of pull down movement. I'm not really, I don't, I'm not really sure exactly what I'm going to do when I'm in there, but hopefully a supinated pull down movement. Um, if I'm here, I'm going to use obviously the Medex I have modified in a way that I can do a, a supinated movement. Or if I'm at a gym, I will look for a hammer strength plate loaded pull down because it spins on just one axis and it's very, very smooth. I think it's a very good choice of equipment for a high intensity training protocol. So um, for the back, for to stimulate the back muscles, the muscles throughout your back, 
a compound row and a pull down and maybe a reverse delt fly if you're up for it. So I'm looking at the muscle groups. That's going to hit everything in the back. Um, then for everything in the front on a pushing on a pushing plane, it's going to be a chest press, um, a shoulder press, and then maybe something for the triceps or maybe a, a delt raise in order to emphasize a particular muscle group a little more. So I'm not really picky about the exercises because I could almost make – whatever exercise work just by concentrating on contracting the muscle, but it's going to be very basic movements. It's going to be a basic chest press, a basic row, pull down shoulder press. And if need be um, a little extra stimulation for the bicep, tricep, forearm, or deltoid. Um, I don't, you know, I don't really believe in a shoulder shrug. I think as long as you're doing um, maybe a reverse delt type of exercise now and then that's going to hit the traps and the pull down in the row is going to um, fatigue the traps enough. But I do very, very, very basic movements. I don't I don't believe in, you know, worrying so much about the form of a new movement every time you go in there because the goal is just to fatigue a particular muscle group and the most basic movements is going to do that the most effectively, I believe. Let's get into your diet. Can you give us a snapshot of a typical day's eating, like right the way through for you? Yeah, I eat virtually the same exact way every single day because <laughs> I do not care much for taste or flavor. I just do not care. To me, the food is just fuel. It's just you put it in, you get on with the rest of your day. So in the morning, it's probably going to be four eggs, a whole egg, a few slices of turkey bacon, and I cook my eggs in either extra virgin olive oil or I like using Kerrygold's grass-fed butter just for the extra omega-3 fatty acids. Um, a snack in between um, breakfast and lunch will be maybe a Mission One protein bar. Um, so Muscle Tech makes these Mission One protein bars with a high amount of fiber in them. And they're not made with any, I think it's like one gram of sugar. So the high amount of fiber slows the digestion of the carbohydrate, which reduces the insulin spike. So it's a, it's a healthier choice protein bar. So you're not going to spike insulin and, and um, drive body fat storage. So I'll either do that or maybe some almonds for a, a snack. Uh, lunch and dinner are virtually the same meal every time. It's going to be, you know, usually... I'm sticking with because, you know, based on my genetics, most people, if they're heavier, I would recommend staying away from, you know, starches or tubers, you know, refined carbohydrates, stay away from no matter what. Those are something I do not eat. But my carbohydrate source usually is a sweet potato um, because it's got a lot of fiber in it. And I believe it's, you know, low enough on the on the GI chart. Um to where um, it's not going to drive fat storage. So usually my lunch is either chicken um, and I eat turkey or ground turkey, really two types of meat. I really don't go too crazy. Um, a sweet potato cooked in Kerrygold's grass-fed butter, green beans or broccoli. And then it's almost the exact same thing for dinner. And that's how I eat. It's, it's the same thing over and over. Some people think I'm crazy or it would drive them crazy, but honestly, I just don't care. You know, I've been doing this for a while when I started to, to – shape up my diet to become a fitness model. It turned into a habit. So I don't really crave anything. I don't, you know, it, I mean, well, one thing I really do crave is peanut butter. I'll eat peanut butter like crazy. Um, but that's probably the only cheat I have. I do not do cheat days. I don't see the point. I mean, if someone must do a cheat day in order for their own sanity, go for it every once in a while. But I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't see the need for a cheat day or any cheat type of meal. My biggest cheat is going to be uh, like skippy, crappy peanut butter. Really, that's about it. So, yeah, very basic. So no, that's really interesting. Uh, I didn't expect that actually. I did expect the same meals uh, to a point, but not quite, not quite like that. Um, mm -hmm. So okay, so you you said lunch and dinner. Um, is that it? Do you have a snack between those or after dinner? Anything you're miss missing there? We're going to supplements uh, afterwards, know, but yeah, yeah, not really. I mean, if I'm going to have a snack between lunch and dinner, it's going to be the same thing. It's going to be like some peanut butter, um, almonds. You know, I have you know almonds sitting on the desk here. Very good. Just pick at them, and um, or just uh, you know the uh, protein bar, high fiber protein bar. It's it's a lot like a Quest bar. Um. After dinner, like I said, I'm eating relatively late 
around 8, 8.30. So I usually don't eat afterwards. So, you know, what I told you is pretty much it day in, day out. It really doesn't change that much. I'm not into, you know, experimenting with different types of foods and tasting things. I just don't care. I just eat. Really? Yeah. So you don't care for taste whatsoever? No. <laughs> you know, it's, you know, my girlfriend in particular, she, she likes salty things. She's got to flavor stuff. Yeah. I'm just like, just give me a plain sweet potato, put the butter on it. It's fine. Eat the whole thing, you know? <laughs> I don't put seasonings or pepper or anything. I just, you know, it's it just, I just don't care. <laughs> Interesting. And I, it's probably just, I just conditioned myself over, you know, eating plain. You know, all other people are snacking on whatever cookies and candy. I was eating, you know, green beans back when I was getting into the modeling thing. So yeah. I think I just kind of trained myself to just deal with boring tasting food. <laughs> so um, would I be right in saying you don't count calories or count protein consumption? Or nope. Have you ever? Uh, I did for a while. And the reason I stopped is because it made absolutely no difference. Okay. So I took, you know, there was a period of time where it was about six months where I was counting protein, carbs, calories, this and that. But it's it's almost impossible to count calories and and measure your calorie expenditure to where I find it almost meaningless because even the food labels are not accurate. And even if the food labels are accurate, your measurement is not accurate. So you're not getting that 200 calories every single time. You're probably getting 175 or 215. So I think counting calories is just – it's it's – too much in, in the in the realm of minutia for me. You know, I'm eating a, an adequate amount of protein each meal, a you know low glycemic carbohydrate source, and I'm adding my fat where I need to, and everything else is going to take care of itself. And I've just noticed doing that and exercising this way, I continue to grow. Back when I was counting calories, carrying tuna and carrying chicken breasts with me to get my protein in every two hours, I was not in as good of shape as I am now. So I think, like I said, it's a much more, I think it's a more broad signal. I think when you're stimulating muscle for repair and growth, it's going to grow and it's going to repair. And I don't think if you have 200 grams of protein versus 215 that, you know, the 215 is going to make your muscles grow exponentially larger. And, you know, that's what, a, a, you know, the media and magazines have gotten you to believe. Um, but it's, it's entirely untrue. I think um, we need a lot less calories and protein that than originally thought for for muscle growth i don't think that you need to bulk i think that's ridiculous um because i have no idea how many calories i'm eating each day and i and I, you know i will still continue to grow i think the whole bulking thing is just going to add a bunch of fat and um so no i really don't i really don't pay attention to it and and it really enforced this way of thinking when i read gary taub's book have you heard of gary taub's yeah yeah i'm a big fan of him and yeah gary in, in, he, yeah he said even if you're the guinness book world record holder of counting calories you still will not get it right and i'm like yeah i've, I've been thinking that for a while so no yeah I, I really don't pay much attention i just stick to clean whole foods you know as, as doug mcguff said i love his, when he said this, he says, anything you could pick or kill with a spear. I love that. And that's exactly what I, you know, how I try to eat. Mm -hmm. And I believe once you're giving your body those nutrients, it's going to promote muscle growth and repair rather than fat storage. So, you know, I believe in calorie partitioning, you know, eating a particular type of food is going to promote more muscle growth than another type of food. The calories don't matter. So 200 calories of a chicken breast is going to promote more muscle growth than to growth than 200 calories of a pop, pop tart. Hands down, you know, in, in, when people say calories are calories, if you get those 200 from either way, you're fine. No, that's that's, you know, the if it fits your macros thing is complete crap. I don't like that. Have you heard of that? Yeah. Yeah. If it, yeah I don't believe in that. You know, people need to hit 1500 calories if it comes from. You know, lollipops or chicken breasts, there's no difference. Of course there's a difference. Come on. You <laughs> eat, you know, 1,500 calories of Snickers bars and tell me you're not going to get fat because you are. I don't even care if you're in a calorie, you know, depleted state. So so I didn't expect that answer either, actually. So you um, – are, yeah. <laughs> are you uh, – I mean, surely, though, you would advocate if someone's like, you know – new to strength training you would still suggest they consume a minimum amount of food uh, whole food or protein mm -hmm. yeah what, so what basically kind of guidance what, would you give yeah so uh, you know because uh, 
I would probably say, you know, four to six ounces of meat at each meal. So I just say, you know, the size of an old iPhone. You know, I used to say the size of an <laughs> iPhone, but now they've gotten bigger. So I have to say the size of an iPhone 5. Um, hey, that's my so, iPhone. There's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, if you're eating meat the size of an iPhone 6S every time, you're probably getting a little more protein than you need. But, you know, I say the size of an old iPhone is what your, your you know, your meat serving should look like. Um, If it's, it depends on the individual. If it's an individual who's looking for fat loss, I'm not going to recommend tubers or any type of refined grain-based carbohydrate, of course. Um, So their meals, I'm mostly going to recommend. I wouldn't, I used to say lean meats, but now I don't really believe in lean meats. I believe in nice fatty meat if it comes from a grass-fed source. But, I mean, if you're getting the crap, probably stay away from, you know, the fattier meats because it's going to have, you know, a lot of omega-6 in it. So what I I recommend is just going to be a meat source about the size of an iPhone 5, you know, deck of cards, whatever. Green vegetables, green beans, cauliflower, broccoli, um, spinach, that sort of thing. And a fat source, um, probably preferably cooked in like some some butter or some olive oil if they're looking for fat loss. And people look at me like I'm crazy. Why would I put olive oil on my vegetables? I'm like, well, you need to. I mean, you want to lose fat. You're going to have to change your diet a little bit here. So if someone is looking to maximize their muscle gains and they're very thin, um, they're going to be able to tolerate more carbohydrates. So, um, you know, I may tell them every now and then have a little bit of rice or, you know, eat a sweet potato, um, about a 400 gram sweet potato at every meal in order to get a little extra calories through carbohydrate. Because there may be some truth to the extra calories thing, but I'm not telling someone to eat 7000 calories at 16 years old to put on some muscle mass. That's stupid, but a little more may be beneficial. So their typical breakfast may include, you know, four eggs, some turkey bacon, um, I would eat a sweet potato for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. That's probably what I would say. So if I were to recommend them, I'd be like, yeah, eggs and a sweet potato for lunch, meat and a sweet potato and for dinner, meat and a sweet potato kind of thing. Um, so the diet would vary depending on the goals. That stuff's all going to get cut out in order to lower serum insulin levels in order to, you know, help the, your, your leptin reach your hypothalamus to trigger release of fat stores. Um, but for um for maximum muscle building it's going to be a little different they could probably if they're an ectomorph they could tolerate a little more carbohydrate so that's kind of where my recommendations would lie what are your thoughts around the whole coffee with fat movement uh, high fat diets like, what, are, what are your thoughts around that? i i do like the high fat diet i practice a high i mean if you're eating low carbs, low refined carbs, you're eating a high fat diet. Where else is the where else are the calories coming from? So uh, you know, I do I do recommend I do recommend and uh, and like the idea of high fat diet because it's very simple and you know I, I don't think our metabolism evolved to eat these refined carbohydrates and I think you're just on a very good path to overall health. If you're staying away from them. So I do believe the high fat diets, um, fats from good sources, of course, um, is very beneficial, not only for body composition, but for hormonal processes in your body and just for overall health and reducing inflammation, those sort of things. Um, very, very, very beneficial. But the whole, you know, the, the fat and the coffee thing, I tried that for a while. I just didn't really like it. I think it's great. I think that's a really good, um, breakfast choice because, you know, introducing and I can't remember exactly where I read this, but I, I did read, I read some sort of research where the, the, the brain is running off of a lot of ketones when you're sleeping. So the second you wake up, if you introduce a high sugar meal, the, the energy source is going to switch yeah. to um, burning glucose as its preferred energy source rather than fats. So introducing fat first thing in the morning may continue to allow your body to burn fats for fuel. I'm not sure if that's been proven, but I've heard it and it kind of makes sense to me. So I believe that is a good breakfast approach because eating fat will also satiate you. So, you know, you have that high sugar, high carbohydrate um, breakfast, you're starving within an hour. If you eat higher fat, you know, the the butter and the coconut oil and the coffee, you're probably going to be satisfied all the way through lunch. So I do think that's a very good weight loss and health approach 
because you're going to eat less. Then normally when you get that dip in blood sugar, you get hungry again. What you're going to do is you're going to go grab another high glycemic bagel or something or a Pop-Tart or something of that nature. And that's just going to cause the insulin problem throughout the day and just going to drive fat storage. So basically just drinking a coffee with fat in it is probably going to eliminate a lot of what's causing the fat storage anyway. So it's, it's more of not that that fat is promoting like superhuman health. I think it's eliminating the bad stuff, right. which is the constant snacking of high glycemic, high sugar foods. For someone who is, I guess, kind of ectomorphic, trying to build muscle, would you advise them to, rather than just go for the fat and coffee approach for the morning, add some protein in there, like maybe protein powder or a protein-based meal? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would. I would because it's going to be easier to hit your overall protein requirement at the end of the day. I'm not saying you have to narrow it down to, oh, you need 150 grams of protein. But if you're eating protein at each meal, you're going to get adequate protein. You know, most people aren't. You know, if you look at what someone typically gets for lunch, a McDonald's hamburger, you're getting this little thin, you know, it looks like a, a mini silver dollar pancake piece of meat that's filled with fillers and crap, you know, if you're eating like that, you're not hitting your protein requirement. If you're eating a decent amount of protein at each meal, you're going to, you're going to hit it. And I don't think measuring and weighing is really necessary at that point, but for an ectomorphic person looking to build muscle, yeah, I would say definitely eat some protein in the morning. So you, so you hit that requirement, you hit what your body needs without really having to think about it. Um, so I, I advocate high protein, high fat first thing in the morning. So like I said, eggs cooked with some butter or olive oil, a little bit of turkey bacon in there, or just eat your eggs with your coffee and fat. I think that's a good approach. I appreciate what you said about how you have no idea how many calories you have day to day. But if you had to guess and eyeball like, you know, an average day, how many calories do you think you consume on, on average? Um, I would say in the neighborhood between three and 4,000, okay. probably around there. Yeah, I mean, I, I used to sort of kind of count, and, and I was usually – over 3,000 um, based on my accounting, yeah. uh, which could have been wrong. You know, things could have been misweighed. I mean, the, you know, the package of whatever, you know, my, my sweet potato maybe wasn't 400 grams. It might have been 300 that time. But it was probably in the neighborhood of three to 4,000. And I think that's adequate. I don't think I even need that much. But when I eat my meals, they're pretty large. Like, I don't know if you've seen a 400-gram sweet potato, but it's – it's big. I'm probably eating around six ounces to meat each time. So my meals are pretty large. So, I mean, I wouldn't say I eat a ton, but again, I'm eating a lot of, you know, good natural food. I'm not eating really anything that drives insulin too high and promotes fat storage. I'm eating, you know, foods that are, you know, conducive to fat loss and really um, foods that can be used and absorbed by muscle for muscle repair, you know, good lean, good protein sources. How do you prepare the sweet potato? Um, normally, I just bake it and um, chop it up into like cubes. And then I put it in a, in a pan with a big dollop of butter and I fry it up and let it absorb the butter. How long did you it bake it for? Amazing. <laughs> What's that? How long did you bake it for? About 40, 45 minutes, I think, is what it usually But And it's then if I get okay. lazy, it's in the microwave. I mean, I, you know, the whole <laughs> you know microwave in your food is going to kill your thing. I don't think it's kind of <laughs> this is why I ask you because whenever I go, Oh yeah, I'm going to have a sweet potato tonight. I'm like, Oh shit, I've got to wait 45 minutes for it to bake in the oven. And yeah, like, or you can microwave like, it for seven. Microwave. <laughs> I mean, if you die at 88 opposed to 89, I mean, I think it's worth saving the time with the microwave. <laughs> you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, but, yeah. So I, yeah. And then a lot of times, I mean, if I'm getting home at eight 30 at night, I'm, I'm throwing the thing in the microwave for seven minutes. You know, I, got it. You know, I don't worry too much about that. I could feel you. Okay. So then literally, you're, if you microwave, it's going to sound like, why am I asking this? But if you microwave it and then you chop it up, you'll still put it straight. You'll fry it for a little bit. Yeah, just to absorb the butter. Nice. Just to I'm absorb not the... about doing that, but that, that probably tastes amazing. And, yeah, it tastes incredible. And it's funny because I, I, you know, I've started on the grass-fed butter thing about six months ago. Yeah. You know, because I couldn't find it. I don't know where it was. And, um, and finally found a grocery store. Yeah, yeah. I used, I used to just extra virgin olive oil on everything. And then I tried this stuff, put it in a sweet potato and oh my God, it tastes like, you know, but I mean, I'm very sensitive to taste cause I don't eat sugary things. So if you put a sweet potato in front of me, I think it tastes amazing. It tastes like heaven compared to the normal person. Be like that's bland and gross, but no, I think it's great. And, um, and if you cook your eggs with 
grass fed butter. It makes them taste much better as well. So yeah, that's pretty much what I do. I just kind of put it in the pan for a second to let the, uh, uh, the potato just absorb the grass fed butter. And I put the butter in just simply for the extra fat, you know, that's all I'm doing it for. I'm not even doing it for taste. I just want the extra fat. Yeah. I do everything for function, not for taste. Do you ever eat junk at all? No, not really. I just don't desire it. And, and the funny thing is, you know, after eating this way for so long, I, you know, I've experimented with it, eat a little bit of junk food, and I just feel so incredibly nauseous afterwards that I can't even handle it. Totally. And, you know, I don't – maybe it's it's because my body has gotten used to eating healthier foods that the sugar overload is viewed as, you know, poison or something. But it just – it makes me feel so sick that it has made me not desire that type of food at all because I associate a Snickers bar with feeling nauseous for two hours, so I just don't eat it. Yeah. So, no, I totally agree with what you're saying because, um, you know, recently I hung out with a bunch of friends and close a group of friends of mine who I really enjoy spending time with. And what I've noticed is at the start, so I, like you, I, I, I eat really, really well, like all the time. Um, mm -hmm. Probably not, I probably, you know, last time I had junk food was probably two weeks ago, whereas food was probably like, you know, two years ago. So, <laughs> um, so probably not quite to your level, but getting there. Um, Anyway, so I'm, I'm I'm having a great catch up with some friends, and then as time goes on, we you know uh, we drink a few beers, we have some pizza, and you can just see everyone's energy levels just totally wane and drop, mm -hmm. and the conversation is just way more basic and not quite as cerebral as it started off to be. Mm -hmm. um, and it, I kind of come out of those situations, and I'm like, ah oh, man, like I knew that would be a much more richer experience for all of us if we didn't just drink the beer and eat the junk food, you know, but mm -hmm. I guess it just takes a bit of discipline, you know, and, and I guess the sad thing is, is that, you know, a lot of my friends, just they have no interest in cutting that stuff out, um, which makes it slightly more challenging for me, but, you know. Yeah, and I think they may just be used to just feeling like crap all the time, because once you, you know, you cut that stuff off, you know, for maybe not even an extensive period of time, maybe for just a few weeks, you start feeling good, and I just noticed, and, and you mentioned beer, I I love beer, but I cannot drink beer. You know, I, it, onto, if I have two beers, onto my second beer, I have a headache. I wake up the next day feeling like I've been hit by a truck. Uh -huh. Cannot drink it. You know, um, and I used to, you know, in college, used to drink beer all the time. It used to be fine. Plenty of them. And then wake up the next day feeling fine. But, you know, even things like alcohol or beer, my body cannot handle it, cannot do it. And it just keeps me away from it. It's easier to not consume those sort of that sort of crappy stuff anymore because it's just based on the way it makes me feel, you know? Yeah. So you're so used to feeling you've got a new normal. Yeah. I mean, I, yeah. I wouldn't say I feel amazing all the time, but I do know that those things make me feel significantly worse. Mm. So it's just, it's, you know, it's, it's a no brainer just to avoid them. So do you, um, do you have, were you on a, say a Friday or Saturday night, go out with friends and socialize and just drink like soda water with lime? Like how do you handle those situations? I, um, I usually just don't drink, you know, I mean, I don't, I don't go out to those type of settings all that frequently anyway, but yeah. normally it would be kind of like a family gathering um, where that sort of setting would, would have alcohol. And, um, I may have one beer and then I'll start to feel, ugh, you know, like my body just starts to feel fatigued. I feel very tired. Um, I start to get a little bit of a headache. And I always used to, you know, believe that it was just due to dehydration. So I'd slug some water sort of thing. But I, I may just have one alcoholic drink and that's it. Just kind of really keep it low because it is just not worth waking up feeling like crap the next day. Yeah. So that's kind of just my approach is just stay away from it. Okay, cool. Good stuff. Um, let's just quickly talk about supplements. So what, what supplements do you take? When do you take them? Supplements, what I do like to take, I, you know, I don't really place too much emphasis on the supplements. I think creatine can be used and have some benefits to it. Protein powders are great if you're a busy person and you just cannot make the meal. Um, but you got to watch what kind you get because a lot of them have a bunch of crap in it. You know, if you're getting a, a $15, you know, five pound tub of protein, it's probably not the highest quality compared to that $70 one. But um, supplements, 
you know, I don't take all that many. Um, I take vitamins. I take fish oil every day, uh, vitamin D, um, a multivitamin. What brands can be most specific? Um, it's all muscle tech. Okay. Because, you know, since I'm a sponsored athlete, I get a, uh, a monthly allowance of whatever I want to order. Well, so, um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I have, you know, I, I'm mostly getting the protein bars, um, the protein bars just for snacks, uh, fish oils. I'm actually just looking on my shelf cause that's where I keep the supplements in my office. So I got fish oil, some creatine. I like to drink amino acids post workout because the, you know, there is some research showing that it is beneficial. Is it the so BCAAs? Yeah. Yep. Brown chain amino acids. Just, Hang on. Um, so you, you drink them, the powder, Yep, just so, uh, it's a in a shaker, just a, a fruit punch flavored drink. Okay, because that's that's the that's the, the clincher there. Because I've I've tried unflavored and it's disgusting. Like, oh, is it? No, I, I didn't even know. They oh yeah, B, I've got the bulk powder. I don't know if they do that in the US. It's a brand over here. Um, BCAAs unflavored and it's bitter and it's so bad. It's oh, like. Wow. It, I mean, I've I've knocked down some pretty horrid protein shakes, and you just stomach it, and you just grit grit your teeth and get through it. But this is so bad that I just can't even I can't I can't do it. So oh. I'm keen to know. Yeah, sorry, go on. What? Uh, so which which brand is it? Which that you use? Muscle Tech? Uh, yeah, yeah, my my sponsor. I obviously I take all of their products. I take the uh, it's called Amino Build. Okay. Like amino acids build, and it tastes so good that you you know you'll want to just drink it all day. Uh, because, uh, you know, and it's funny. I look, I look at the label, and there's no sugar in it, and I'm like, there's got to be sugar in it. But <laughs> it's it's very sweet, and it's it's actually pretty delicious. So it's actually very easy to drink. So I'll drink that post workout sometimes. I mean, you know, I don't I don't place a huge emphasis on getting these supplements in, um, okay. because I you know I believe you know the diet. First of all, I believe you know the the way you look. Um, from your exercise protocol is is almost entirely genetic <laughs> and uh secondary uh in second place comes diet and in uh third place comes your protocol for instance so okay. and a far distant fourth is probably supplements i don't think it's going to make the difference between you know looking like an average joe to looking like phil heath but um i think they can be used uh to help recovery you know create or like uh, creatine um, I do like to go through little bouts where I use creatine and I do feel, feel a little better or it's placebo. I don't know, but I mean, if you know, they're free supplements, I'm going to use them even if it is a placebo effect and, uh, branch chain amino acids and basically, you know, your, your multivitamins, fish oils, that's pretty much all I use, you know, and these mass builders, muscle gain, these pills with all this stuff. I, I can't, I just, I can't wrap around my head that they, they possibly make much of a difference. Yeah. Uh, when you back in the day, so when you were like weight training, when you were younger, say in your late teens, did you eat well then? No, no, I ate terribly. Um, which is which is funny, and this is a, another example where genetics come into play. And when I was a senior in high school, I ate McDonald's every single day. <laughs> For lunch, I had four double cheeseburgers and four apple pies. There was probably about two to three thousand calories of garbage there. <laughs> And, and you um, were like 6% body fat or something. Shredded. Absolutely <laughs> shredded. 165 pounds shredded to the bone. This is when, you know, people were still saying I was on steroids and I was, yeah. I was skinny. I was skinny, but, I, you know, shredded. It didn't gain a pound. And um, ate, right. ate like complete crap. I was very, very strong. Um, very strong, very fast runner. Um, but ate like crap and it, it just didn't, it didn't matter. I started eating well when I was about 20. 20, I'm 26 years old now. I started eating when I was about 22. Okay. I well, and by eating well, I meant I was starting to choose chicken instead of ch- cheeseburgers type thing. I wasn't really dialing in omega three fatty acids at that point. What well, um, what's your hundred meter time? Just out of interest. Oh, my hundred meter back when I was in high school it was an eleven two. Nice. Um, so yeah, that was way that was way back then. <laughs> I was I was a little bit faster in in college. Um, are you familiar with the 40 yard dash times? Uh, yeah, for, uh, they, they test college yeah. or they test football players. And then I ran about a, uh, four, four, eight, which oh, is wow. pretty quick. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah, that was, I, I was more of a, a sprinter long jumper when I did college track. I was a very, very fast person, um, which kind of brought me into the, uh, football college football. You know, it's interesting cause I interviewed and you, you may have listened to this one, uh, Keith Norris, who, yeah. 
you know, was on track to, I think, I think he had a short professional career. I can't rem- recall, or he was either on track to be a, you know, a, a high level professional American football player. Did you have the dream as a kid where you were like, oh yeah, that's what I want to do with my life. Um, and then you said, you, and then you had the epiphany where you're like, I'm getting injured all the time. This sucks. Um, yeah, 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 I, I did, did. I did, you know, and I think our parents are largely responsible for installing this dream into our head, which is, it's an unrealistic dream. And, and, you know, honestly, even if I had the ability, I wouldn't want to be a professional football player because it's, you know, I think I read somewhere the average um, lifespan of a professional football player is like 57 years or something yeah, like that. I've, I've read and, that. Yeah, and, the you know, the traumatic brain injuries, the concussions, you know, even myself, I've sustained so many concussions that, um, you know, it can't, cannot cannot be healthy. So, you know, the dream was installed in me, you know, at a young age to where I thought maybe there was an option because, you know, when you're, you know, 10 years old and you're running around the football field and nobody can catch you, you know, your parents probably think, well, maybe this kid's a, you know, anomaly here. And they kind of, yeah, you know, become a professional football player. But, you know, as soon as I got out of high school, I knew that wasn't, you know, I didn't go to a division one college um, to play football. So I knew that was kind of, you know, out of reach. And then once I got to college, you know, balancing the workload of school, and, you know, practice and weightlifting, practicing twice a day and weightlifting and film, it just made no sense to me. I was kind of, you know, you know, I don't love the sport enough to sustain sh- constant shoulder injuries and lack of sleep for it. So I said this was kind of uh, kind of pointless. I'd rather just go to class. <laughs> you know, I, you know and, and I didn't even like going to class, but I'd rather go to class than play football at that point. <laughs> Uh, that's really interesting. Um, okay, cool. So let's uh, let's get into your sleep. You mentioned how seven eight seven to eight hours you recommend, and you feel that sleep's really important. Um, what time do you go to bed on average at the moment? Um, probably between nine o'clock and nine thirty. Yeah, it's it's. I'm I go to bed super early, and I feel like old, like an old man. Um, but again, I'm getting up around you know six, um, sometimes earlier. Um, but yeah, you know, I don't, I, I think sleep is very, very important. So I try to be asleep before 10, 10 PM every single night. And personally, I notice the difference. If I get an hour less or I go to sleep later, I'm, you know, garbage throughout the rest of the day. I'm tired. Yeah. I, do, I don't, I cannot, you know, think as clearly as I would, as I would have. Um, so I, I believe that that is one aspect of life that people are not placing enough emphasis on is getting adequate sleep. Um, most of my clients, I kind of ask them about their sleep patterns, and some of them are getting three hours a night. And I'm like, "How are you awake? <laughs> you know, how are how are you walking around right now?" And the only, you know, my only assumption is that they're probably drinking a lot of uh, stimulant, a lot of caffeine, in order to keep them awake, which of course isn't going to be good. But I think, and especially, you know, the recovery side of the of the exercise equation here, the sleep is is very very important when it comes to recovery and if you're expecting to get maximum muscle gains off of five hours of sleep for most people it's probably going to be a hindrance to your recovery ability and the amount of um uh, result you can produce from your exercise so sleep is very important to say the least um what time do you normally wait so you said you wake at six six a.m is your wake time is it yeah, it's around, yeah, probably around six. I'm, I'm asleep, you know, before 10, up a little after six usually. That's what I was going to ask you. So I didn't ask you about drinks. Do you drink coffee? Do you, what do you tend to drink throughout the day? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, black coffee is normally the first thing I drink when I, when I wake up, just black Starbucks branded coffee out of a Keurig. Um, it's funny, I, you know, when I started drinking coffee, I was putting the sugary creamers and the plus additional sugar in it. And, you know, I, I won't even put sugar in it anymore because I just don't see the need. You know, I put, put a little bit – if I were to put a little bit of sugar in it, it would just be like, why? What am I doing this for? I'd rather have a little bit of bitterness than have that crap running through my body. So, I mean, that's a little compulsive, a little bit of compulsive behavior. But I just think, you know, you know, black coffee is, is the best thing, especially, you know, first thing in the morning in a fasted state. You know, you drink some caffeine, you've you've risen your heart rate, your metabolism's running a little faster, you're burning a little, I guess, extra calories, if that matters, but you're burning a little more. So I'm probably going to, you know, drink some coffee and probably not eat for about an hour or two hours after I wake up. I kind of like to 
sit in that fasted state for a little while. What do you, what, what does the first 90 minutes of your day look like? The first 90 minutes, first thing I do when I, when I wake up is get some coffee, sit down, um, check to see what social media accounts are doing. And I always just find something exercise related to read, you know, or read, start reading a book that right now I'm reading, um, Dr. Robert Lustig, um, fat chance, which is a great Uh, book. Um, so I'll mostly just, uh, for the first, you know, 30 minutes or so before I have to head off to the studio, I'll just, you know, read whichever book I'm reading at the time with a cup of coffee. Okay, cool. I like that. Um, just on that then, what uh, what book have you gifted the most? The book I've gifted the most um, is actually not an exercise. Well, if it were an exercise book, it would be Body by Science, hands down. That book was incredible and which really opened my eyes and got me inspired to to train train people properly. You read the Q&A but, as well, yeah? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I've read both of them so many times I probably have them memorized. <laughs> but um, – you know, the book I've gifted the most was uh, How to Win Friends and Influence People by Dale Carnegie. I think that is a great book, um, a great book just filled with life lessons and how to approach life and how to interact with people. Because, you know, people are very interesting. We're very interesting creatures and interacting with them every day is, is something you – probably should become good at if you want to, you know, succeed in life or make life enjoyable. So I think that was a very good book when it came to learning how to interact, interact with people in a business setting and as well as a personal setting. So that is a book I've actually given as gifts and recommended to people the most. Cool. That's great. Next book. to Body by Science. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Um, God, I do. I hope I, I Doug must, must make loads of money from my podcast. I, at least he, I hope he, he does because he <laughs> I know. It. Yeah. Well, he did his homework and he did his work and he's inspired a lot of people, oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, to, to, you know, the approach towards proper exercise and diet. And yeah, he is, you know, he's definitely, you know, one of my idols and just in general. Have you met? And I, I do appreciate, you know, a lot of the stuff that he puts out. So, hey, if I if I send some business this way, he deserves it. Have you met Doug before? Or? I have not. I've, yeah. you know, I've done a phone uh, consultation with him yeah. um, just for questions regarding uh, training people at my studio. But that's all. OK, cool. I love I'd love to go through one of his workouts. That's for sure. It'll probably destroy me. <laughs> Someday. No, definitely. Uh, you should get that on YouTube. Um so, okay, we talked about diet, we talked about training. You've been really explicit about everything you do, which I really appreciate. And I think people are going to love this so much. Really? Um, what else do you do that you haven't mentioned? And I appreciate genetics is such a big factor, but what else do you do that you feel is really important that you want to share that helps you get the best results? You know, the, what I really like to drive home to people to my client, well, to my clients, but mostly the young bodybuilder, the, the person who is supposed to, or who is, who's looking to add muscle. First of all, you know, your idea of the ideal physique and what you are looking to achieve may not be feasible for you. It may not, it may be, but it also may not be. So work your hardest, do everything, you know, you can you know, on the path towards achieving that physique, but do not be disappointed if you if you don't get exactly what you're looking for. So, you know, I try to, especially the younger or, you know, my peers or friends who are looking for this shredded physique similar to, you know, shredded muscular physique, um, you know, don't be dis- disappointed and discouraged if you don't achieve what the media has led you to believe to be, you know, a perfect physique. Your physique is fine. You you be the best that you can be. Um, and when it comes to an exercise, you know, tip, I really try to articulate and try to get people to understand the the feeling of contracting your muscle and and uh, focusing and concentrating on the particular muscle group as you do the exercise, you know, not so much hopping in the machine and moving the armature around um, and hope that your muscles can be stimulated, but using the machine to stimulate the muscle. So I tell people, you know, I will, some of my clients, I will actually touch the muscle we're trying to target and trying to stimulate and say, feel that muscle, contract that muscle, contract it, tighten it up. And, and, you know, particularly on the leg curl, machine i said if it feels like it's going to cramp up you're doing it properly that sort of thing like really focus on contracting the muscle and stimulating the muscle rather than just moving the machine you know if you're reaching failure and i tell people you know my clients 
when they're reaching the point where they cannot push, I say, do not try to you know, sacrifice your form just to get that repetition. Accept that you've achieved muscular failure. I like to say achieve muscular failure. Accept that you've achieved muscular failure and continue to create tension. Don't try to force that repetition through because in order to get that repetition, you're A, recruiting another muscle group, or B, sacrificing form, neither of which we want to do. So those are kind of the exercise tips that I like to help people. But the number one thing I like to, aside from teaching people muscular failure, is to really try to focus on contracting the particular muscle group that you're trying to work rather than just trying to complete the movement. Do you advocate um, kind of forced hyperventilation during the exercise, much like body by size? Um, yeah, I mean, a lot of the times when it comes to when it comes to breathing, um, especially on an abdominal exercise, I tell people not to think about it too much because it's very difficult to breathe, especially on the Maddox Ab Crunch machine, since it's right up in your chest. It's very it's difficult to breathe. So I, in that case, I tell people to just just breathe. Don't think about it too much. Just try to breathe. Um, but I do, I, I wouldn't, I know a lot of people call it hyperventilation, but sounds you know, dramatic, doesn't it? I tell people to relax their jaw, re- relax their face. Something I was taught while doing track is you want, you know, if someone were to take a video of you, of you or a picture, your cheeks will look like they're fluttering. You want to relax your face. You don't want to grimace, relax and sort of, uh, kind of pant like a dog is, is kind of what I tell them to do. Cause hyperventilate is a scary thing to tell a client as they're <laughs> exercising. So I'm not going to tell them to hyperventilate, but to just sort of pant like a dog. And I just demonstrate for them. I say, now continue to breathe, <gasps> you know, breathe with your lungs, you know, this sort of thing. So I guess it is along the lines of that sort of hyperventilation type, uh, uh breathing method. But, um, I tell them to pant <laughs> really. <laughs> Cool. Um, so this is the. Are you, sorry, have you, are you good for time now, Jay? Is it we've got yeah, no, 10, it's, 10, 15 minutes? Yeah, it's fine. Just the, the phone ringing. It goes to my cell phone, so it just rings once. Oh, okay. So, so you're kidding us. All I, that, it's all that business you got coming in, Jay. That's what it is. <laughs> it is. It is. A couple clients every week that keep coming in. I can't take anymore, unfortunately. But oh, really? Is that where it's, where you're at right now? Yeah, yeah. It's at the point where, you know, I'm at capacity now. I get. I can't, I, I simply can't, nor do I want to devote, you know, you know, training people till 9 PM or getting up at four in the morning to train people. So yeah, I'm pretty much at capacity at this point. Just on that actually before, cause I'm want to shoot into the rapid fire round. See that shoot into it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, God, that's corny. And um, before we do that, I'd like to understand like, what are you, cause you're, like you say, you're at, you're at, a uh, you know, built this fantastic personal training business. You've got this kind of, you know, part-time modeling thing on the side. Like what are your goals over the next kind of like one to three years for you in terms of business and contribution, all that stuff? You know, I would love to become um, a recognizable figure in the high intensity community is, you know, what I would love to love to happen. And it seems that I'm on that path right now. Um, I would like to, you know, my, my goal is always to try to train as many people as possible. I would like to have multiple studios and multiple locations to train as many people as I can in this, in this type of protocol. But I really would love to get more people to, I don't like to say believe, but understand um, the principle of high intensity training. Um, I think it's an, it's an extremely good approach and I know it's not going to sell gym equipment. It's not going to sell as many supplements. It's not going to sell treadmills. And that's probably why it has not been as successful as um, I wish it was, because it's really not, you know, too marketable for a lot of the products that go along with the fitness industry. But my goal is to, you know, really raise awareness that this is an extremely effective protocol and one that should be followed by most people. Because especially in in Western society, we we live extremely busy lives. And uh, to expect someone to go to the gym for an hour or two every day is is ridiculous and probably why most of the people fail um, at achieving their fitness goals is because it's just there's just not enough time in the day. So to you know convince and get people to understand that that is possible to do it um, in a much shorter amount of time is something that I really want to push and really want to get a lot of people to understand and open their eyes to it. So you know as a contribution to um, the exercise community, that's what I want to do. And as a business, um, um, in regards to business. Um, I would like to, you know, operate multiple studios and uh, 
instruct us in multiple locations and train as many people as I can. Cool. What do you say? You're, you mentioned how you're quite big on social media at the start of the day. Um, mm-hmm. What are you? What are your main platforms? I mean, I've seen you on Facebook. You've got some amazing pics. Um, but what platforms are you working on building? Um, so far, um, I'm working on um, just Instagram. I'm doing a little bit of LinkedIn for the studio. Mm-hmm. Instagram seems to be very big and Facebook. Instagram seems to be growing a lot more. So what I really like to do with Instagram is, you know, it's about pictures. So I have to post a picture of my physique most of the time in order to get people to read what the heck I have to say. <laughs> so normally it's kind of like rehash pictures of my physique. And then I'll go into um, a little factoid of training or a, uh, a diet, um, a diet tip. You know, I'll take a picture of, you know, fish oils and say, you know, do this to reduce systemic inflammation and um, increase the amount of EPA that your body, you know, something like that. Um, Just I like to use them as um, informative platforms, you know, try to 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 get this information that seems to be hiding to get it out to people, because, you know, people are going to look at a lot of these other fitness model YouTubers and listen to their ridiculous exercise protocols and supplement protocols. Um, so I'm trying to hopefully propel myself to that level. So, you know, when they click on YouTube or Instagram, maybe they don't go to this guy and read all of his crap, but maybe go to, you know, my side and read some of the facts. Yeah. And um, that's really what I'm, you know, trying to propel myself into is to become influential enough to provide the factual information. Because, you know, the the people who, the experts on these topics, unfortunately, are not going to get the type of attention that a fitness model may or a bodybuilder might. Right. So um, I'm going to use that to my advantage yeah. in order to get this type of information out there mm-hmm. and to increase um, the amount this information is actually viewed. Because, I mean, the high intensity training community has tried very hard to do this. And unfortunately, they just do not have. Um, the marketability that the bodybuilding industry does. I think you knocked it right on the head. Is is it is you're absolutely right. It's um, like we're going back to what we were saying. You need to use your physique as the mm-hmm. marketing tool, um, and it sounds manipulative, but it works, and it works to get people through the door so they can then find out what this is all about. Um, right. And a lot of the guys in this space, they don't look great, um, or mm. they haven't. Yeah. They don't, or they haven't practiced a self discipline to maintain their their physiques, um, and it does not help in terms of trying to get people into this this niche. So I totally agree with you, and I think that's great. And I'll do whatever I can to support that um, and, and share because I think what you're doing is awesome. I love I love what you're doing on Facebook. I think. You know, I I am one of these people. I'm so lazy sometimes. I won't read an article, someone's post. I'll just read what they write in the post um, mm-hmm. because you know we're absolutely bombarded with information these days. It can be difficult to find the time to read a full article. Um, so I like what you're doing on Facebook, where you're doing like you know, this is what I get asked, and this is how I respond, and it's really interesting. And then you did the one about the um, EPA and fats. Mm-hmm. Um, I am getting an acronym right, aren't I? EPA? Yeah, yeah, EPA. Yeah. Uh, and stuff like that. So keep doing that because I think that's great. And I've done it myself and seen that I've had quite a lot of success in terms of engagement from doing that versus here's a link to a blog post. <laughs> exactly. Ironic, Nobody is but... going to read an article on uh, the benefits of EPA and omega 3 fatty acids on systemic inflammation. There, nobody's <laughs> going to read an article on that. But if you take a picture of fish oils next to some chicken and, <laughs> and a nice shiny container and write a little bit, you know, I try to, um, you know, not keep it too scientific so where people can actually grasp it and understand it. Yeah. You know, it's I try to make it easy to read. And I just try to present that sort of information because, I mean, none of my peers know what the heck EPA is and how important it could be for them and, you know, getting the right type of fatty acids into their body and, and avoiding the, the uh, refined carbohydrates. So, yeah, I try, I try to just use these platforms to just provide that information because if you provide a nice picture with this type of information, it's going to get some views. I've, I've, and I've just noticed through experience, you know, sharing an article that I really enjoyed, just sharing it and say, wow, this is amazing. You should read this. You know, I get one like. You know, put a picture, put a picture of my arm up there and put some 
you know, scientific information of, of you know, whatever fatty acids or, or motor unit recruitment, 50 likes, you know, it's, it's it, you know, and that's just the way, that's just that the way it works. I mean, that's, and so I figured that out and now I'm just starting to use it to my advantage. I mean, it kind of bothers me that people don't want to, you know, read or seek out the information, but I mean, maybe that's just how the human brain works. You're just attracted to something like that. And maybe it. Read it. So I'm just going to use it. Okay, so rapid fire round. Obviously, the answers don't have to be rapid fire. Um, best piece of advice you've ever been given? The best piece of advice. Um, well, I do. I do like to read a lot of, um, and not so much. Yeah, ph- philosophical. I mean, one of one of my favorite authors. His name is Stuart Wilde. He's uh, he's into metaphysics and, you know, some of that I kind of I kind of do like some of that. Some of it's a little far fetched for me, but I do kind of like the whole metaphysical uh, approach to life. Um, uh, Stuart Wilde, I remember him saying, you know, we we set our own limitations and we allow our peers to set our limitations for us. And once I read that, it made so much sense to me. And we do. We do set our own limitations. Um so why not set them high is the way I look at it. So ever since I read that, I've been, you know, I decided to have extraordinarily high aspirations and limitations because you're sort of dictated to what you can achieve by what people tell you you can achieve and what you believe you can achieve. So if you can convince yourself that you can achieve a lot, likely you're going to get there. And I've done that, you know, within the past. I mean, when I told people I wanted to be a fitness model in the beginning, they looked at me like I'm crazy. And then I open up the magazine and I show them say, yeah, well, look what I did. And this isn't even good enough for me. I want to do a lot more than this. You know, so I believe that was a really good piece of advice, although not given to me directly. It's something that I tend to stand by and live by is to really, you know, don't set your limitations comparable to what your peers are doing. If you want to achieve something great, believe you can do it and just go for it. Because just because most people don't do it or cannot do it does not mean that it's unattainable. That's some good advice. What have you changed your mind about in the last year? Um, Calories in versus calories out. <laughs> you know, but back in, uh, you know, about a year ago, I would say if someone wanted to lose weight, that it was an energy expenditure problem. They need to expend more calories than they take in. Okay. And I believe that measuring and calorie counting was more important back then. But uh, the more I research, it seems like a load of crap, honestly. I mean, I, I think it, fat loss has almost in, almost entirely has to do with insulin. And uh, keeping insulin low and allowing particular hormones to do their job, such as leptin, which is a hormone released by fat cells to um, signal to the hypothalamus to burn rather than store. This is a hormone that is, is being interfered with when insulin is too high in the bloodstream and simply lowering insulin through you know, food choices and, and dietary approach is almost all that needs to be done when it comes to fat loss and calorie counting is, is far less important than food choice. So that's one thing I've, I've changed my mind about. Okay. So only in the last year you've changed your mind about that. Would you say? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, Probably within, within probably. Yeah. Within the past year. And it's kind of a new kick I'm going on, you know, reading a lot about, you know, how the science of fat loss and, and uh, all, all the hormones that dictate whether fat is lost or fat is stored and how the body responds to certain types of food regarding uh, calorie partitioning. Okay. You know, um, you've probably seen him, but Doug's got some great YouTube videos on fat loss mechanisms. And he's such a great, he's great at articulating it in a, in a mm-hmm. way which just really resonates with myself. Um, have you seen those videos at all? Yeah, I have seen them. He does. He, yeah, he, he does give a, a pretty, a good, more of a, a general description of how, how the process works. Um, but at the moment I'm, you know, this is one of the few times I'm really digging into the minutia. I really want to see exactly what's going on in the body. And I don't think they particularly know, um, you know, fact for fact, exactly what's going on, but they're, they're getting closer and it is something that I'm really interested in. But yeah, I have, I have seen his videos and, and, you know, read his piece in body by science on fat loss and, it, it seems to be, you know, right, right on the money. Yeah. Okay. So 
What is the best way for people to contact you, Jay, and find out more about what you're doing? The uh, best way to contact me, I mean, they can uh, go to my um, web or not website email, which is jvincentfitness at gmail.com. I do get a lot of questions um, from, I guess, fans or exercise enthusiasts and answer their questions. And I really enjoy answering the questions. Um, I do a little bit of online coaching too, you know, competition coaching. Um, I, I have a couple of uh, figure competitors right now, females, uh, helping them lose the weight and do some proper exercise in order to put on a little bit of lean muscle mass before the competition. I do some coaching, distance coaching, and uh, I just like to ask any questions people people feel like asking me. So when I have the free time, which isn't you know too often these days, um, I will say go through go through emails and answer whatever questions people have. So that's jvincentfitness at gmail.com, J-A-Y, Vincent Fitness, all one word, at gmail.com. Very cool. And uh, for all the show notes and resources that Jay and I mentioned in this interview, please head over to corpwarrior.com, C-O-R-P, warrior.com. And uh, that's pretty much it, Jay. Well, it was epic. I think we've, we've done over two hours there. So Great. Be, uh, and I really appreciate your time. It's, uh, I've learned a ton talking to you. And, Absolutely. Uh, it was a pleasure. Uh, likewise. So enjoy the rest of your day. Um, I know you've got stacked uh, list of clients coming in this afternoon. I do. It never ends. But hey, this is what I asked for and I thoroughly enjoy it. Exactly. First world problems. Eh? <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> Could be worse problems not having any clients, for instance. Exactly. Cool. All right, Jay. Take care and uh, thanks again. I appreciate it. Thank you, Lawrence. Cheers. All the best, mate. This podcast is brought to you by hituni.com. That's H-I-T-Uni.com. HitUni is an e-learning course provider specializing in high-intensity training for personal trainers and for people looking to learn how to apply the principles of HIT to their own training for best results. It comes highly recommended by Body by Science author Dr. Doug McGuff, Discover Strength CEO Luke Carlson, MedEx Precision Fitness owner Blair Wilson, HIT expert Drew Bay, and the founder of Live and La Vida Low Carb, Jimmy Moore. It was founded by author and high-intensity training master personal trainer Simon Shawcross. Simon has 15 years experience and has supervised over 15,000 workouts. Due to a combination of demand and a lack of quality in certification programs in the fields of high-intensity training, Simon and his team spent the last three years developing top-quality courses that will educate fitness professionals and participants to enable them to train individuals and themselves in the safest manner and produce best results. Hit Uni has been put together using knowledge from the very best minds in the field of exercise, including Skylar Tanner, James Steele, Dr. Doug McGuff, Drew Bay, John Little, Mike Menser, Arthur Jones, Dr. Ellington Darden, and many more. The courses are delivered online through the website, where you can learn via a variety of multimedia materials at your own pace and convenience. The online video presentations are engaging and make learning fun. Online support and a discussion forum are provided to resolve any sticking points and enable you to share ideas and ask for help. Depending on whether you want to become a personal trainer or already a personal trainer who wants to upskill or if you're a keen HIT participant that is eager to learn more about how you can apply HIT to your own workouts for maximum benefit, there are several great value courses to choose from. I am personally partway through the PT course and I'm really enjoying it. I primarily wanted to do the course to learn more about how to apply HIT to my own training for better results. The courses are really easy to follow and each section is organized into bite-sized chunks that give you a real sense of achievement after you complete each one. To get your exclusive Corporate Warrior 10% discount on any course you purchase, simply head on over to hituni.com, that's H-I-T-U-N-I.com, and enter the coupon code CW10, that's CW and the number 10. So again, head on over to hituni.com, H-I-T-U-N-I.com, pick your course and enter the coupon code CW10. Thanks very much for your support.